Hi, and welcome to Verso. I'm Anna Ara. I'm one of Verso editors and Verso curators. Thank you all for being here. For those of you who are new to Verso, it is Verso's live space to showcase the writers, philosophers, artists, and activists who challenge ideas and social landscapes with their work. It is a safe, open, and intimate environment for people to experiment and create community with one another. We are based in Amsterdam, and bi-monthly, you can find us at Mesram. And this one time, we are happy to have you join us for this special live-ish edition of Verso. We have some news to share with you before we continue with the show. As some of you remember last fall, which seems so long ago now. We made the big announcement of our transition from an arts and literary journal to Amsterdam's international small press publisher and launched the inaugural Amsterdam Open Book Prize contest. We would like to congratulate Fee Griffin, whose poetry collection for work for TV will be published by Versal. And congratulations to the runner-up, Tanatse Gambura, for her collection, Things I Have Forgotten Before. And of course, we would like to thank all the writers and artists who entrusted us with their beautiful manuscripts. We hope they all find a home. Sending them all a round of virtual love. Back to the show. The theme of this edition of Verso is On the Tips of Our Tongues, co-curated by Yun Ingrid Lee. Featuring work from Jonathan Rose, Jun Yu, Tamam, and Lucia Dove. Yun, thank you so much for putting this Verso together. I am handing it over to you from here. Everyone, enjoy the show and see you on the other side. This is a follow-along score for retuning your ears. To participate, you will need two glasses or jars that can fit over your ears. And speakers. Step one, turn your speakers up high without hurting your ears. Step two, follow along.
The last time I saw my grandfather before he passed away was also the first time I'd seen him in 10 years. It was summer in southern Taiwan. Hot. Humid. My head was shaved and I was wearing a dress. My mother brought me and my sister to our grandfather's house before taking my sister to get a haircut. I stayed to cool down. The moments after they left, I see my grandfather studying me, confused. He asks, Whose son are you? He asks with his thick Taiwanese accent that my mother and her siblings made fun of as kids. The same way that my sister and I tease my mother for her English. He repeats, in the only language we can communicate, but also a language we were both slowly losing. I answer telling him my name, and my mother is his daughter. But he's still confused, starts speaking Taiwanese, and becomes more frustrated that we don't seem to understand each other. In fact, the only thing I understand is which means you don't understand. Just a few months ago, I was reminded of this feeling of awkwardness and discomfort when I attended this week-long movement workshop. I didn't do so much research, and so I didn't know exactly what to expect. So I was pretty surprised when I arrived late. After getting stuck in an elevator, it was not my fault, <clears throat> and was thrust into the middle of a choreographed phrase. I didn't even know what a phrase was. But it got faster and faster and faster, and I assumed everyone else must have come from some kind of dance background. Because while everyone else looked graceful in their trained bodies, I was flailing around and throwing myself on the floor and rolling in the wrong direction just to catch up, and everything was just wrong. And at first I tried my best to catch up, to fit in. But as the other participants got stronger and more nuanced in their movements, I just got progressively more flustered and clumsy. And I realized, who the hell am I getting? I'm not a contemporary dancer, and I'm not here to pretend to be one. And once I realized this, my anxiety sort of faded, and I could focus on the other exercises, bring my own expertise into doing them my way, or at least struggling through to find a way if I didn't already have one. And I still sucked at the choreography. But creatively, it still led me to the really interesting places that I never would have gone if I didn't stick with it. I think this feeling of not fitting in, but struggling to, is something similar to the feeling of having a word stuck on the tip of your tongue. Wanting to express yourself as best as you can in the language that your listener can understand. But having lost the capacity to do so, or not having acquired the vocabulary just yet. I find the struggle, if you stick with it, if you don't retreat, can be very generative. Maybe you invent your own nonsense words. Or you start gesturing. Maybe your mistakes lead to something way more interesting. New movements, sounds, rhythms, articulations. The point of articulating yourself is to be as easily readable as possible, whether that's verbally, visually, or otherwise. Of course, it helps you to navigate the world more smoothly, but creatively, these are dead ends to me. I think a lot about my grandfather's confusion, seeing me as a boy back when I still identified as more of a tomboy and how it may have been an uncomfortable moment back then. But now would actually make me feel really seen in my gender presentation. I think about this and I feel more relaxed and accepting in not being articulate in everything I say or do because it means that the translation of myself continues. These days, I feel more comfortable talking to my mother in my broken Mandarin and I appreciate all the mistakes she makes in English. All of these awkward, funny, and in hindsight, genuinely lovely moments of struggling to communicate and failing to form the basis for tonight's program on the tips of our tongues. 
featuring Lucia Dove, Pletty Helminth, Jun Yu, and Jonathan Bruce. I hope you enjoy this verse, so. Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. I will start with a small anecdote. A couple of weeks ago, I was having a quarrel with my partner, of whom I share my tiny one-bedroom studio with. As it is probably the same with some of you now, we both have to work from home on the only dining table we have. Being an easily agitated person, I often found myself scrambling for words to express properly my anger or frustration or even the issues during a conflict. As he was saying, it barely happens, probably only twice in the past month. But it isn't about how often it happens, it's just about that it has happened for more than enough times. I started to sense at the bottom of my tongue an insurmountable gap between our experiences that cannot be overcome with anything we can say. To win the argument, I eventually blurred out, we have completely different experience of time, to summarize the complete failure of our communication. Now, you might think I'll move in the direction of a couple therapeutic sessions on communication, Sadly, on the contrary, I'm here to make things worse. First, this sentence only served as a carrier of my frustration and unable to express myself properly. Later, my emergency blurb has dawned on me some of the impossibilities in translation in general. Even with things that are rather straightforward at a glance, such as time. My mother tongue is a dialect of Chinese, and in modern Mandarin, which is the official language of mainland China. Time is 时间, but when I say 时间, am I talking about the same thing as when an English speaker says time? The term 时间 we use now in Chinese was translated from English, first into Japanese, read as jigan, but written the same because Japanese use kanji, which means Chinese character. Before I go further, I should first say something about Chinese as a hieroglyphic language. Before the invention of Mandarin as the official spoken language in the 1960s, people in different parts of China spoke different dialects and sometimes could hardly understand each other verbally. Throughout time, the only constant that united people in the vast land was the characters. No matter where you're from, the written language was the same and throughout time remained rather stable. A hieroglyphic character resembles the look of things it tries to depict. For example, Ru originally looked like this, and it was drawn after the sun. And more abstract notions are made by combining different elements together, such as Jin, meaning the in-between space, originally looked like this, which was a combination of a slit between a two-fold door and the moon depicting seeing the moon through the door slit. Now let's look at the translation of time in Japanese, jikan. It was composed of two characters, ji, a moment, and ma, in between or intervals. So together it means between moments. It perhaps illustrates a time that connects equal intervals as points on the line. But before Eastern Asian cultures adopt this translation of time, what was their concept of time? Was it different? In China, earliest form of writing, as shown on the oracle bones, indicates the first distinction of different periods of time was made between the day and night, where day is signified by ri, as the sun, and evening, when there is still light but the sun has set, is signified by xi, originally looked like this, that has a connection with the moon that looked like this. And the concept of a year was established with the arrival of cultivation of grains as staple food. And a year is when the harvest of a crop happens. As you can see, the character of year looks like a person carrying a rice plant. Subsequently, seasonality, because of its importance in crop cultivation, was the central point in dividing time in early Chinese culture. The year has four shi corresponding to four seasons, and this is subsequently divided further into 24 solar terms, 
each links to a significant agricultural activities that need to happen at that time. There are fifteen days within each solar terms, and each day has a different significance to agricultural practices. And seasonality is cyclical movement, so the cyclicality of time is deeply ingrained within Chinese culture. The cyclicality was still significant when the calculation of time started to enter an abstract realm, and then time was no longer tightly or directly linked to an earthly object. The oldest calendar system of China makes use of a sexagenary cycle, where a pair between ten heavenly stems and twelve earthly branches are used to record time. If we pair them one by one. According to certain rules that is based on the Yin Yang cosmology, we have a cycle of ten, twelve, and sixty, thus making sixty days or sixty years a cycle. Through the elaborate cosmology, where systematic use of mathematical operations were tightly linked to astronomical observations and astrological predictions, these cycles have far-reaching practical implications on everyone's life. For example, as moral guidance, such as the Confucian saying, "When I become sixty, my ears will receive the truth from heaven without any obstacles." With this simplified illustration, I hope to bring forward two central differences in Eastern Asian experience and understanding of time. One that is an experience of time that cannot be separate from the object of which this time belongs to. So a time that is specific, you can even say unique to each object, and it is also cyclical, and with an importance placed on certain moments rather than the duration in between. Another is the experience that is highly organized in algebra operation, rather than the geometric operation that contrasts to the Greek abstraction of time, which underscores the concept of time in English. I think now it is time to return to the quarrel I had with my partner, and perhaps my experience that is grounded on a cyclicality let me simply forget about the time in between each incidence and instead focus on its recurrence. A word or a language is based in a framework that have cultural specificity, and this framework conditions our experience and memories. So, is translation of this different experience possible through words? On another note, how we experience time and interpret time has a significant impact on culture, and the way we construct relations with each other, with everything. Spoken through Zarathustra's mouth, Nietzsche thinks that the ultimate human injury is the inability to overcome finitude. And we have a vengeful nature towards time, because human has to die, and that will be the end. But I hope that I have managed to illustrate that the experience and the concept of time are not necessarily universal, and this poses deep questions on how we can express these differences within the limit of language, and how we can transform these differences despite the impossibility of translation. As now it is again a critical moment that we reflect on these difficulties in a crisis that enlarges the divide between us. There is a question for everyone to ponder: How can we give time and space to each other when the differences in our experience can have unexpected impact on a daily basis?
I lost the first language that I spoke. I'm half Russian and half English, half this, half that, neither one nor the other. But if we were defined by language, then I would be decidedly English. I was born in Essex, England, but spoke Russian for my early years, as that's what my mum spoke to me. In 2016, at the age of 90, John Berger published Confabulations, a series of essays on language. In the opening section, titled Self-Portraits, he asks us to consider the term mother tongue. In Russian, he writes, the term is Rodna Yazik, which means nearest or dearest tongue. At a pinch, one could call it darling tongue. Mother tongue is our first language, first heard as infants from the mouths of our mothers, hence the logic of the term. When the time came for me to start school, I was being spoken to in a mix of Russian and English. At this point, I stopped speaking altogether, possibly in a state of linguistic confusion or protest. Mum switched to speaking completely in English. In the last few years, I have wrongly defined my Russianness, my sense of being Russian, by my inability to speak the language of my mother. I'm starting to now understand how that was wrong. How I feel when I see my name in Russian Cyrillic, lacking wanting, more, more. In 2018, my Russian grandfather, my Derushka, died. While in Moscow for his funeral, I realized that I had anticipated his death from the moment that I could understand that I loved him. He was unwell, so his death wasn't unexpected, but still, when I was told the news, it felt as if someone had stood at the window of his kitchen, 30 storeys high, and dropped a market bought watermelon from it. Say cucumber. Say ugurets. Aloud, I say ugurets. Feel embarrassed. Time gives a twirl, and now Dedushka is dead. I have all these questions. How long does it take for a coffin to disintegrate? And does drinking vodka really warm the blood? Say Cucumber is the title poem of my first pamphlet of poetry that came out with Broken Sleep Books last year. Cucumber, Ugarets, was one of the words out of my collection of random Russian vocabulary that I would say with Dedushka and which he would use to show me off in front of his friends and family. In the book I'm currently reading, the author Charlie Gear, among many other things, writes about the paradoxical qualities of language and the poetic experience of desubjectification. He draws on Hugo von Hofmannsthal's short work, The Lord Shando's Letter, in which he imagines his fictional peer explained to Francis Bacon, the 17th century philosopher, that he is losing the ability to use language. This is a situation, Gear writes, which is not without its pleasurable moments, but which are not nameable. In the letter, some of these include a watering can, a harrow left in a field, a dog in the sun, a shabby churchyard. For the novelist Enrique Villa Matas, the letter represents a manifesto of the passing away of the word, the shipwreck of the ego, in the convulsed and indistinct flow of things which can no longer be named or tamed by language. 
My unnameable, pleasurable moments include a tin of brass polish, carrots pulled from the soil, an aunt kneading shoulders, pilmoni floating in soup, I'm interested in how my visceral memories of Russia and my family have filled the space created by the absence of language fluency. It is not through the Russian language that I have come to understand and love my and love my Russianness, but through the loss of it. Russian Caravan. If you feed diesel to a petrol samovar, you will hear that atomaric, ar aromatic splutter turn all the tall birch trees black. This pungent earth, Krasivaya, with soil so rich you can make black tea with it. If you do not take care when taking a sip, you will smoke your tongue, staring out of the old window to the moving tips of lemon onion domes, and your kiss will be hot like fresh pancakes with jam. If you leave it to ferment in the forest with the fertile peat deeply underground, I can guarantee it will run better. The taste will be of freshly picked mushrooms eaten from a wooden lojka by the lake. If you need to dry leaves on open pine fires for ease of digestion and fuel, please first protect your hands with smithana and tie around your fingers some dill. You know I couldn't bear to see them burn. Dacha. It is easy to tell lies to yourself, little ones like white maggots, like believing that are like swimming in still lakes like coating memories in flower, as if every lake in every place is the same one my aunt and I would swim in, every morning the water still cold and unmoved. No lake is the same as that, not even that lake is the same as that. I doubt it would recognise me now, squirming with the weeds, frightened of the dragonflies. Lenin's Demon. Silk is the new spring material. The Empress slacks dirtied in the canal. The guards picked mushrooms from private land. The back pedal brakes failed. The beach in Ireland reappeared after 30 troublesome years. The islanders found lost memories and empty shells. Gunpowder, torn hems, whale bones. Forgotten film reels roll together. An accordionist stands in a corner and flares its lungs for the girl, ankle deep in river, singing on the silent screen. The red pepper's ribs were ripped out and discarded. Charcoal turned the skin black. The barbecue on the beach was attended by the bourgeoisie in numbers. The sandbanks in Shubri Ness are made of shattered ceramics and sediments. Salt water sits differently to fresh. Grey jellyfish bob around unexploded bombs. In the city, the canals flooded. The fountains overflowed with old pennies. Chapels were overrun by prayers. Cisterns burst. Lost hats, odd shoes, sewerage. People queue around the block for black bread. Grandmothers make marmalade. Teenagers swing in hammocks, jump in lakes, kiss and marry soldiers in secret. A pilot steals eels from Stalin. The plane's engines fail to start. Nixon calculates the long-term implications of things with his fingers. His secretary types a letter to sign. Stalin's denim didn't suit him. No one spoke of how terrible they looked on him, save his wife who was tired of dying them because they were fading so fast. The pilot's granddaughter is a seamstress. Her husband still keeps guns in the cellar. 
He presses cider to sell, but drinks it. In the spring, she escapes to England. Eyes looked like peppercorns, she thought. She sucked the heads out of prawns and ate haddock with a chip fork. She walked, smoked, stole vinegar and lemon. Lenin's denim was torn at the knees. Sand rubbed against his skin in jelly sandals. He was drunk, desperate, sunburnt. They chased him until he tripped and bloodied the boulders. Yeltsin's linen shrunk in the wash. That day in the sun that turned his girl's hair sandstone blonde, she scrubbed the grass stains from her denim in the shallow river. A mother yearns for summer. Rough sheets on a washboard, a wrung out tongue, dreams of unearthing cool potatoes, picking cucumbers, stuffing cabbage hearts. Sleep comes heavy like rainwater to Brezhnev. He takes long walks home after work, negotiates boulevards, dodging icicles that form and drop from drains in the dark. A girl watches as a woman bashes birch branches on her skin for circulation. This ritual, the heat, smell, the nakedness, makes the rush of blood almost surface. The tide ripped in at low sunset. Lying down in his denim, only Lenin saw how a thousand lost fortresses were rebuilt in minutes, save the crabs that live in them now.
Hello. 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 Okay. So, um, I want to tell a story which is uh, one of the famous paradoxes by a, a Greek philosopher named Zeno of Elia. And Zeno is famous for having several paradoxes that deny the idea of plurality, uh, the idea of motion, um, the idea of change. And uh, he was a student of probably the father of Greek metaphysics, um, Parmenides, Aulia, uh, who believed that change, variation, um, specifics were illusions, and that actually the world was one single thing. Um, it's very, very much a kind of predecessor to Plato's idea of uh, ideal forms in, in some sense. So Zeno has a number of paradoxes where he uses logical constructions and arguments to prove that things that seem common sense are not common sense or are absurd. Um, one of the most famous ones is uh, the paradox of motion. And this is told in different formulations. I'm going to tell it in the formulation of a discourse between um, Achilles, the great Greek hero of the Trojan War, and the tortoise. Achilles, in these stories, is kind of like your sort of like stereotypical uh, you know, idea of like a jock who's all muscle and no brains. He's very fast, he's strong, and the tortoise is very smart, but also all of the things that Achilles is not.
So, Zeno's original paradox goes something like this. So the tortoise and Achilles are hanging out. The tortoise challenges Achilles to a race, claiming that he would win as long as Achilles gave him a small head start. Achilles laughs at this. He was a mighty warrior and swift of foot, and the tortoise was a tortoise. But he was a humoring chap. And Achilles asks the tortoise, how much of a head start do you need? Ten meters. <laughs> Achilles laughed. Well, ten meters, you're going to lose. I mean, you need a much bigger head start. Do you know I'm Achilles? Um, but if you want to race, let's do it. On the contrary, says the tortoise. I will win, even with 10 meters head start, and I can prove it to you by a simple argument. Go on then, said Achilles. Now, when Achilles replies, he has a little bit of a look of disdain on his face. Uh, he's not as confident, because he's had many arguments with this tortoise in the past, 
and they didn't usually end up good because you know he knows he's Achilles. He knows he's a strong and fast, but he also knows that the tortoise is much sharper witted than he is. Suppose began the tortoise, that you give me that 10 meter head start. Would you say that you could cover that 10 meters pretty fast? Yes, of course, an Achilles. Um, the tortoise continued, well, okay, in that amount of time, how far do you think I would have gone? And Achilles thinks for a moment, says, well, yeah, if I'm, if I'm running 10 meters, you'll probably make it another meter ahead of me. Okay, so now there's a meter between us and the tortoise. And then you would catch up with that that meter really fast. Uh, yeah, of course, Achilles! Um, he replies. Uh, then the tortoise says, well, but also, you know, while you're crossing that last meter, I'll also have been going a little bit farther, maybe 10 centimeters. Um, so you still need to catch up that 10 centimeter distance. Yes, said Achilles. And while you're crossing that 10 centimeters, I'll still be going forward, adding a new distance, um, however small. And you'll need to catch up with that new distance. So at this point, Achilles is silent. continues well so you see in each moment that you'll be in the process of catching up the distance between us I'll be adding a new distance and you'll always be catching up so you can never catch up represent one of two states. 
Add more bits and you can represent more states. Two bits can represent two times two states. That's four possibilities. Four bits can represent two times two times two times two states. That's 16 possibilities. Sixteen bits. Well, that's two times two times two times two, sixteen times, is enough to represent about sixty-five thousand variations. Most digital audio is coming to you at this resolution. My voice right now is coming to you in sixteen bits. Every fragment of a fragment of a fragment of sound is represented by one of these 16-bit values. This is my voice being represented by four bits. That's 16 possibilities. This is my voice being represented by two possibilities. One bit. The English language has 26 letters in its alphabet, 40 phonetic sounds. Facebook offers 71 options for a person's gender. That's seven bits. Actually, seven bits can represent more variations than that. 128. So there's still 57 genders left. The dispute over the existence of reality in mathematical entities is an example of what philosophers call the problem of universals. This is the question as to whether abstract concepts have some sort of real existence in the world or whether they exist only in our minds. Like most philosophical problems, it seems to be more a question about language than a question about the world. Certainly numbers do not have tangible existence in the world. They exist in our collective consciousness. And yet, they're not arbitrary products of our imagination in the way that fictional characters are. This brings us to the end of this edition of Verso, on the tips of our tongues. I would like to thank Jonathan, June, Lucia, Tamam, and Yun for sharing your work and vision with us. We would like to also thank the Netherlands Letter and Fonds for generously supporting this season of Verso. And thank you all for tuning in. We miss you, and we look forward to seeing you in the fall at our beloved Mezrab, where we can sit down with some soup and share a drink. Please stay in touch with us on the socials. We want to hear how you're doing. Um, stay safe and see you soon. Bye.
Thank <laughs> you.